from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Good afternoon. Welcome, everyone. I'm Susan Vita, Chief of the Music Division, and I'm pleased to welcome you to the Library of Congress and to the Coolidge Auditorium. This lecture recital is the fourth in a series co-sponsored by the Library of Congress and the American Musical Music Musicological Society. And this is a special lecture demonstration indeed. We've been privileged to hear talks by scholars who have included as part of their programs performances demonstrating the fruits of their research. Two such previous lectures, for example, dealt with holdings in the collections of Irving Berlin and Leonard Bernstein. Today's program is truly noteworthy, though, because it considers the performance practice of one of our most valuable treasures, a holograph, holograph score of Ludwig, I can't talk today, I'm sorry. <laughs> Ludwig von, von Beethoven's Piano Sonata, Opus 109. I hope all of you had a chance to see it before you came in. Based on the studies of the manuscript, our lecturer, Professor William Meredith, director of the Ira F. Brilliant Center for Beethoven Studies, will explain what Beethoven tells pianists not to do. We will then be treated to a performance of the sonata by pianist Shin Huang, playing a forte piano provided especially for this recital by Malcolm Bilson. Wait till you hear this forte piano. For our part, in addition to providing the Coolidge Auditorium, our most venerable performance venue, we offer an exhibit in the Coolidge for your the holograph score itself under the curation of Ray White. This event promises to be a truly engaging one, which, as always, we hope will inspire current and future scholars to consider the many holdings in the music division. As always, the lecture will be available as a webcast on the Library of Congress's website, so look for it there. Before we hear our program, however, it is my pleasure to introduce Professor Ann Walters Robinson, Claire Du. Swift Distinguished Service Professor of Music at the University of Chicago and President of the American Musicological Society. The AMS remains enormously grateful to the Library of Congress and its Music Division for facilitating the research of our scholars and for offering us the opportunity to discuss the results of our work with the public. Our program today will shed light on a masterpiece of European music, the manuscript for which resides here in our own Library of Congress. And it is my great pleasure to introduce a music historian and two expert performers on the Forte piano who will bring both the history and the sound of the stunning sonata Opus 109 of Beethoven to life. William Meredith, is director of the Ira F. Brilliant Center for Beethoven Studies and professor in the School of Music and Dance at San Jose State University. At the Brilliant Center, he co-directs the invaluable database called the Beethoven Gateway, which includes more than 18,000 bibliographic entries. He's co-editor of the series entitled The Critical Reception of Beethoven's Music by His German Contemporaries, editor of the award-winning Beethoven Journal, the only regularly appearing periodical on Beethoven scholarship and events, and editor of the monograph series called North American Beethoven Studies. Professor Meredith is himself the author of many studies on Beethoven, touching from everything from the composer's work habits and improvisational techniques to his portraits and, most famously, the two fragments of his skull that surfaced in 2005. Bill's interest in Beethoven's Sonata Opus 109 is a very long standing. It was the subject of his doctoral dissertation, which he completed at the University of North Carolina in 1985. Although unable to perform the entire sonata for us today, owing to a hand injury, the incomparable Malcolm Bilson is with us and will respond to questions later and demonstrate a few things uh, about the forte piano, which he has kindly brought with him. Professor Bilson 
has enjoyed an extensive career that, uh, as a soloist and chamber player and is largely responsible for restoring the forte piano to the concert stage. He's a member of the music department faculty at Cornell and an adjunct member at the Eastman School of Music. Professor Bilson has given us many new recordings written of music written for forte piano, including the three most important complete cycles of piano works of Mozart, as well as sonatas by Schubert and Haydn. And in 1994, Professor Bilson and six of his former artist pupils presented the 32 piano sonatas of Beethoven in New York City, the first time ever that these works had been heard as a cycle on period instruments. He offers annual summer forte piano workshops in the United States and Europe. And here to perform Beethoven's Opus 109 for us is Xin Huang. Mr. Huang is currently pursuing a dual master's degree in piano performance and forte piano at the University of Michigan. He made his public debut as a pianist with Beethoven's third piano concerto, and he has also performed extensively on the harpsichord and the forte piano. He is receiving wide acclaim for his playing, most recently garnering third prize in the Westfield International Forte Piano Competition. As they begin their lecture demonstration entitled What the Autograph Can Tell Us, Beethoven's Sonata in E Major, Opus 109, please join me in welcoming William Meredith, Malcolm Bilson, and Xin Huang. introductions. Um, I should explain that um, Malcolm and Chen will both be uh, demonstrating and I ask Malcolm to talk, I will ask Malcolm to talk about a couple of spots where he has his own expertise. So you will get to hear Malcolm play as well. But I am greatly in their debt as I joked with Malcolm in an email, musicology without music is just ology and um, <laughs> it's not as much fun as musicology. Um, Without a doubt, one of the treasures of the enormous autograph collection of the Library of Congress is the manuscript of Beethoven's uh, late piano sonata in E major, Opus 109. Setting aside its status as a treasure, however, the manuscript warrants careful investigation and our listening attention today for the record of its compositional history embedded on the pages of the manuscript. Anyone with even a casual acquaintance with Beethoven's manuscripts, however, knows that they are notorious for being illegible. Indeed, Beethoven is the bad boy of all classical composers in this regard. Fortunately for our purposes, however, the autograph of Opus 109 is relatively easy to decipher. On a Beethovenian scale of 1 to 10, 1 being pretty clean to 10 being a royal mess, this autograph is a mere 2 or a 3, though my grade may, grade may surprise you when you see some of the pages. It's actually a very good thing, it's as clean as it is, since believe it or not, Beethoven sent the autograph in the mail to Berlin to have a copy prepared that is unfortunately lost that was used to make the first edition of the Sonata. There is another copy that survives in Vienna that was made for Beethoven's patron, Archduke Rudolph. Archduke Rudolph always wanted to get uh, his own personal handwritten copy of Beethoven's music before they were published. But that one did, doesn't have anything to do with the publication of the of the piece itself. Now as you go out and look at the autograph after today's talk, you'll see that there are lots of marginalia marks, which prove to us that, believe it or not, the manuscript was sent back to Beethoven in the mail in Vienna, and he used it to proofread the first edition and the first copy. It got very confusing, but he did his best, let's just say that. As it turns out, however, we musicians and scholars should be grateful for whatever illegibility exists not just because it seems to record the steamy heat of compositional inspiration, but rather because it demonstrates that Beethoven often prematurely began writing out what became the final score. The number of compositional decisions made when the single staff sketches of piano music were fleshed out to two staves can be astonishing to observe at times, proving that the work did not exist in Beethoven's mind in a neat, complete form a la Mozart when he began the work of writing out the autograph. Indeed, as he once noted in a letter to his friend Karl Holtz, 
If a manuscript of a work was lost and he had to write it again, the work would be lost in that original version. Carefully examining the work's creation, including trying to peer underneath some of those corrections, forces us to reinterpret what we think Beethoven was trying to express. The point of such an intellectual and musical venture is not to turn the study of music into music pathology, but to see that sketch and autograph studies are ultimately most informative for what they tell us about meaning, and thus the interpretation of that meaning in the hands of performers. This afternoon, I'd like to speak briefly about three details of the autograph. One is philosophical, one is philosophical and practical, and one is purely practical. Since philosophy can be the most taxing of these things, I'll start there, even if it puts us at the beginning of the third movement with its two different titles. And if you look up on the, at slide number one, this is the manuscript, and it's the beginning of the uh, third movement. All right. Um, as you can see, the first title of the third movement on the autograph is given in the top in Italian, which is the usual language of classical music. And underneath it is, uh, the second title is written in German. The Italian title was written in pencil first, and it was later rewritten in ink. The German title does not appear to have first been written in pencil, just in ink. So what do they mean? The Italian title means moderately slow in a very singing and expressive manner. The German title, however, says song with heartfelt feeling. The word song, gesang, also appears in Beethoven's sketches for the third movement of the sonata in page 65 of the Archeria 195 sketchbook. Let me get that slide up. Now, this is a terrible slide for you to look at, so look at the webcast version. On the fourth line down, two-thirds of the way over to the right, there's the word gazong. So I was happy to find the word again in the sketches because it helps us uh, tell that Beethoven kept thinking of it that way. Uh, this uh, is another place from the sketches that I thought I would share with you. Beethoven doesn't often write the, the Italian movement titles, but this is a sketch for the theme of the last movement. And you can see that Beethoven wrote con molto sentimento et, et, et espressivo, in a very feeling or sentimental manner, also expressively. So this title is a little bit closer to the German version. Now, the copyist who made the copy for Archduke Rudolph was very careful. He copied exactly what he saw on the page. He didn't edit it whatsoever. So you can see that this is the corrected copy score that still survives in Vienna. It's the beginning of the third movement, and it says Gazam, song, with uh, inner feeling, right? However, when we get to the first edition, and I asked Ray White if he could bring it for you to see, Beethoven's Gazang had changed into Gazangful, which means songfully normally, it's translated that way, which is much more like molto cantabile. Two questions come to mind when I first saw this or noticed it on the first edition. Did Beethoven authorize the change? Was he the one that changed it from Gazang to Gazangful? And does the change from Gazang to Gazangful matter? Who cares? The answer to the first question is unknown, though Beethoven on occasion would refer to, uh, on occasion to linguists. For example, Beethoven decided wrongly that the piano had been invented by Germans and it should have a German title. And there are some very, very funny letters where Beethoven tries out different German titles. And he says, but it really should be handed to a linguist to decide this. This is why one of the sonatas is called the Hammerklavier because he wanted the late sonatas to be called with a German name. And in fact, the first page of the manuscript of Opus 109 says Sonata for the Hammerklavier. So the answer to the second question, why does it matter if it's Gazang or Gazangful, gets to the heart of my philosophical question. In his magisterial book on the Beethoven String Quartets from 1966, Joseph Kerman wrote about one of the most important features of Beethoven's late music. He called it the new vocal impulse. In his usual evocative prose, Joe Kerman wrote, quote, an equally strong public impulse accompanies the private one, a striking new directness of emotional appeal, a determination to touch common mankind as nakedly as possible. Never in the past had Beethoven reached so urgently for immediacy. There is something very moving about the spectacle of this composer having reached heights of subtlety in the pure manipulation of tonal materials, battering at the communications barrier with every weapon on his knowledge. The great exemplar of this drive is the Ninth Symphony. As Wagner never tired of driving home, 
the Ninth Symphony brings to the orchestra words, poetry, and the human voice in an effort to make instrumental music more articulate. Writing about the same impulse in the string quartets, Kerman continued, a string quartet is not so exhibitionist a creature as a choral symphony. Nonetheless, the five quartets and the great few which occupied the end of Beethoven's composing life after the Ninth Symphony are drenched in evocations of the human voice. These evocations mean to sing or to speak instantly to the heart, like the songs imagined by Beethoven's poet at the climax of Andi Bernagelita. <coughs> and this is the words from the song. What I from my full heart artlessly have sounded, only aware of its longings. Joe Kerman goes on to say, in the last period, the illusion of art concealing art, of communication without the adornments of art, is among Beethoven's very particular studies. One is carried away, astonished and ravished by the sheer songfulness of the late quartets, by recitative and aria, lead, hymn, country dance, theme and variations, lyricism in all its manifestations. And that's the end of this wonderful quote. Herman's point about the sheer songfulness so brilliantly expressed must, I argue, be extended backwards before the Ninth Symphony to at least the sonata we are talking about today, as well as to the last two sonatas. Opus 109, as you see, have seen, has a song. Opus 110 has a famous lamenting song. And Opus 111 has an arietta. All of these, literally, are songs without words, that famous romantic genre of Mendelssohn and his friends. Given the importance of song in the late works, we may wish to return to the title of the last, we may wish to return the title of the last movement to Beethoven's original German for that reason alone. However, there's another reason, one that is related to the same song cycle Joe Kerman mentioned above, Andi Fernigolita, to the distant beloved. The second phrase of the variation theme of Opus 109 is an almost exact transposed form of a phrase in the song. The words in this phrase are, and a loving heart attains what a loving heart has consecrated. So there's the first edition of um, the phrase that we're talking about, and it's the und ein lieben Herz erreichet part of the phrase. And so here is the phrase in the piano sonata. You can see it in the melody. I'm going to go back, and it matches that first phrase in the song cycle, which has the words, and a loving heart attains. The song is set in E flat major. The sonata is in E major. Both of these keys make sense in terms of the meanings of the works. To the Distant Beloved ultimately speaks about unfulfilled love, and thus uses what Beethoven scholar Paul Ellison has recently proven is the third meaning of E flat major during the classical period. It was used for unhappy love, sleep music, night music, darkness. E major, according to Ellison's research, was used in two different ways during the classical period. The first uses which were wild, fiery, brilliantly passionate music. The second was for love, sometimes hopeless, sometimes tender. Given the Italian and German titles of the third movement of Opus 109, Beethoven must have been using E major in its second meaning, hopeless but tender love. In fact, if Beethoven had been a country singer, hopeless love would probably have been his national nickname especially given the inevitable failure of his love affair with Josephine of Brunswick when he was in his mid-30s and the failure of the immortal beloved affair of 1812, which seems to have ended his hopes for romantic love on this earth. Since the song cycle Anti Fernigolipta is widely believed by Beethoven scholars to have been composed with the immortal beloved in mind, and since it is widely agreed by most Beethoven scholars that the phrase in Opus 109 is related to the immortal beloved, uh, the Gazan of Opus 109 is assuredly a song that is related to love that is unattained on this earth. Given that historical background, let me return to the autograph of Opus 109 and its simple German word, Gazan. Though it was changed to songfully on the first edition, perhaps by the publisher, the word is an early signpost towards that impulse to evoke the human voice in the next two piano sonatas, the Ninth Symphony and the Last Quartets. Gazan also points us towards the sonata's meaning, the last movement is intimately connected to that ultimate consecration of love he alludes to in the uh, Andi Fernigolipta, and specifically to the words, and a loving heart attains. The last variation in particular of the sonata depicts to my ears 
the fulfillment of that attainment in these fantastically difficult measures, which emphasize the Andefernik Galipta phrase in the highest register of the piano, which Beethoven often reserves for depictions of heavenly, immortal, or transcendental uh, events. So I'm going to ask Shin to play this extremely difficult passage for you, and I should probably keep saying that it's difficult. <laughs> Fun to see up here and watch because it's almost at the end of the keyboard. Um, those high notes are, there are very few notes left. There's four more notes that you could possibly use. Thus, the original autographs, the original notations on autographs can both open doors for listeners on how we might understand pieces as we hear them and also inform pianists about what they are supposed to be communicating to us. My second example has to do with other details of the manuscript. I'd like to focus on something that Beethoven originally wrote and then crossed out. Um, with the help of Malcolm Bilson, so I'm going to ask them to switch seats for a moment, we'll demonstrate how what Beethoven wrote affects every performance of this sonata you will ever hear. The first example concerns the connection between the ethereal end of the first movement of the sonata and the beginning of the second movement. When Beethoven first wrote out the ending of the first movement, he wrote a pedal marking on the first beat of the next to last measure, and the pedal marking you can see at the beginning of the measure is actually on the first beat of the measure. And he wrote at the afterwards, he wrote his normal squiggly line. So if you look up here, it's this thing that looks like this. All right, so he wrote that to indicate, and that's the sign to indicate the end of a movement. However, he immediately grabbed a piece of cloth, blotted out the sign so that it partly disappeared. You can still see it underneath it. And he wrote a double bar sign, which is normally used not to show the break between two different sections, not two different movements. Um, and then finally, and I'll show you this in a minute, on the beginning of the next measure, he wrote lift for the pedal mark. Now the lifts for pedal marks are O signs, okay? Now I might point out that this is very interesting because as I discovered when I was writing my dissertation, the first movement of this piano sonata was originally written to be part of a pianoforte method. It was not written to be part of a sonata. And one of Beethoven's friends writes in the conversation book, why don't you use the new little piece for the sonata? So that was the inspiration for it. This is the beginning of the second movement, and you can see the O sign to indicate lift the pedal. Now, Beethoven also originally wrote three or four words after the end of the first movement. Let me go back to it, you can see them. So do you see after the end of the first movement, there's a nice scrawl passage? All right. So he wrote three or four words underneath there before he, he sent the manuscript to the publisher. And there is a blown up version of it. Okay. Even looking at this photograph of the autograph, it is clear that the letters T-A-C-C-A -C -C -A are on the first line, and the words Il Presto appear on the second line underneath all of the swirls. When you look at the manuscript in person, and you can do it afterwards, because I asked Ray White to open it to this very page, um, it's quite clear that the first letter in the word is a capital letter A, strongly suggesting that the phrase was attacca subito il presto, right? Attack the presto right away. This is indeed how the Beethoven scholar Barry Cooper interpreted the words in the notes to his recent edition of the piano sonatas. Such an interpretation is certainly supported by similar words written into other autographs. My first example comes from the end of the first movement of the Moonlight Sonata. So here's the Moonlight Sonata, and you can see in faint ink, which means it was added at a different time than when he wrote out the notes, Ataka. And then here's an example from the Appassionata Sonata. Now, Beethoven was not a good speller in any language. <laughs> <laughs> so musicians out there, don't adopt this spelling, please. Um, but he does normally spell it either with one or two T's, okay? 
Um, now, if we cut the word Ataka from the autograph of the Moonlight Sonata, the one on this one, and we overlay it on Opus 109, you'll see that it's almost a perfect fit. So that's pasting it in on top of the Opus 109 autograph. It fits together really well. So with a little detective work, we know that Beethoven's original direction tells the pianist to either, and there's two different meanings for Ataka in 19th century music dictionaries. The first definition is begin the next movement without a pause after the fermata. The second definition is to only have a short pause. Okay. After he crossed off the attacker, however, Beethoven did not cross off the lift pedal mark on the downbeat of the next movement, as mentioned earlier. So this is the end of the first movement in the autograph and the beginning of the second movement, and you can see that the O is not crossed off. The copyist who made the copy for Archduke Rudolf did exactly what he was supposed to do. He copied the manuscript. So here's the beginning of the second movement in this copyist manuscript. There's the faith, the O. However, the first edition doesn't have the lift pedal mark. And it's not in many modern editions, actually. Whether the pedal, pedal lift should be there or not, however, is unclear in the sources, especially because there's two important sources that are lost. Now, they may be still surviving somewhere. If you know where they are, come tell me afterwards. Um, <laughs> The first one is the copy that was made in Berlin, and then there's a first edition that has Beethoven's markings on it. Now, on the Beethoven Center, we have an original 1823 Broadwood piano. I was curious, how long is the low chord, the low chord that ends the first movement, how long does it last on a piano of Beethoven's time? So on our, uh, there's, there's two perspectives. One is the perspective of the person sitting at the piano, and one is the perspective of people in an audience. So the Beethoven Center Broadwood piano, which is a little different than Beethoven's Broadwood, the sound, that chord lasts about 12 or 14 seconds if you're in the audience before it fades away. We also have an original 1827 piano made by Matthias Jakesh. On that one, it sounds a little bit longer, 15 or 16 seconds before it dies away. Now, for point of comparison, I have a modern Bruckner piano at my house, so I went home and tried it. Um, it sounds for about 15 to 18 seconds if you're in the audience, but if you're sitting at the piano, the chord lasts almost half a minute. So, this is one of the places where um, I'm going to ask Malcolm to both play the end of the movement. I would like for you to hear how long the chord lasts in the audience. Um, so, and the reason I'm doing this is how long should the pianist wait in between the movements? Beethoven originally wrote Ataka, but then he crossed it out, but there's still that pedal marking to hold the sound. So the question for every pianist is, how long should I hold the sound? The one thing that I think we do know, and Malcolm and I frequently disagree on things, so that will be part of the fun of today, is that um, I don't think that the pianist should attack. I don't think it should be an immediate connection. I don't think it should be um, sort of rude. Maybe what I'll do is do a little bit more and then let him talk, because there's a Beethoven scholar named William Kinderman that has a, a wonderful description of the beginning of the second movement. Um, Kinderman said, in the finished work, the breaking off of the final cadence in the lofty high register in favor of the soft syncopated chord, several octaves lower, becomes an important means of intermovement transition. The juxtaposition of this tender, tentative, understated close to the first movement with the fortissimo opening of the second movement is striking and is underscored by the connected pedal marking. The emphatic beginning of the second movement seems to shout, no! to the ending of the vivace, contradicting E major with the darker sound of E minor, while supplanting the lyric impulse of the first movement with a breathless driving intensity that Beethoven underscored in his unusual designation to this final movement, prestissimo, in other words, as fast as possible. Kinderman's shout, no, is the crux of the matter. How soon should the shout interrupt and dispel the reverie of the first movement's endings? So, Malcolm, could you play the chord, the low chord, and just let us just hear how long it lasts? Just the chord. Just the chord. <laughs> just low. How loud do I play it? Uh, that's up to you. Air conditioning. Yes. <laughs> Took over. You never that get air conditioning <laughs> turned off in federal buildings. Beethoven had that trouble. <laughs> um, now, to help answer the question, all right, we need to focus on three simple symbols at the ending of the first movement that help create its meaning. 
The first symbol is the rise to a high register. And Shin already brilliantly demonstrated that at the end of the sonata, Beethoven has the climax of the whole sonata be up in this heavenly register up very high. Beginning from middle C and measure 89, the right hand begins a gradual rise over two and a half octaves to G sharp. As been noted in the scholarly literature, Beethoven frequently symbolizes the eternal, the immortal heaven with such high registers, as have hundreds of composers before him. So Malcolm, could you play that sort of rise from 89 to, to the end? Well, first of all, you've got this. Well, let me this. get to that. Let me get to that. Okay, see, no. Descends very briefly up to the high part. Now, the second symbol is whoops, is a symbol that's uh, hundreds of years old in music, and this is a symbol that's related to the scale passage. And what it is is the scale steps, the minor scale step six moving to five, a pattern that has been used for centuries to depict grief or anguish, as Derek Cook demonstrated a long time ago in 1959. Beethoven first presents the minor version of this pattern in the melody in measures 89 and 91. And you can see it there, that's measure 89. Malcolm, could you play that measure for us? So it's just that da 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 da. But then Beethoven counters the minor version with the major version of the 6 5 pattern, which is a, a shape that's used to depict joy. So what he does is he rocks back and forth between minor, major, minor, major. Could you play the, that part? And it's all the window. Yes. Until you get, until minor wins. Until minor wins and you start going up. Yes. And then the last two measures before the movement ends, this is the very last part. Imagine treble clefs, uh, please, and E major. Um, the last two measures that are very high are the 6-5 shape in major that represents joy. And if you look at the second one, it has a sforzando on it and an accent. So Malcolm, if you could play those and if you want us to talk about that. Yeah, I do want to talk about it. Talk. Can I talk a little bit about this Please. whole thing? We were talking this morning. There are several things that I think uh, we could talk about here. First of all, um, one of my doctoral students some years ago, David Brighton, who's now teaching at Oberlin, wrote his thesis on Beethoven and the pedal, which is a wonderful subject for a thesis because there's hardly any information. All you have is these few pedal markings, and it's, you, you have to use a lot of intuition. But he came to me one day and he said, you know, what's, I discovered something interesting. If there's a single pedal mark in a movement, it's always on the last measure on the last note and there is no release. Uh, that starts in opus, opus 26, which is this piece, this movement. This ends like that and goes on. Now he doesn't write a taka there, but he does write a taka as you put it out as, as you put it forth in the moonlight, and also in Opus 27, number one. And, uh, and further complicating this, we just saw in the autograph, which was crossed out, that their pedal marking in pencil is actually back on this last measure, that, that, he, that he says, take the pedal here. This also complicates it. So you don't believe it's a talk. Mm -hmm. The one thing I don't look Well, and here's... you have to wait at least two seconds. Oh, I don't uh, know. I don't know how long. I don't know how long I have to wait. How but... long do you normally wait when you play it? I know it depends on the hall. Well, it, it, it depends also, I think, on what I would call the psychology. Doesn't so it? it Certainly, depends. yes. Yeah, yeah. D, 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 D. I mean, I certainly wouldn't do that, obviously. <laughs> do you connect the pedal through? You live on, on, on it, not not before it. Like maybe a split second. Mm -hmm. So of course, this is nice if you, if you yes, do it that so way. So so. Can you do that again a little louder so that I can get you? Well, it's so in major, but the next chord is minor. So if you keep the pedal down, there's a. 
Yeah, I would do that too. The minute I do this, I put the pedal down. Put, put, put the dampers down. Yeah. yeah. All right, so, so we stay on schedule. Um, but I just want to just say one thing that what, <laughs> or not, very, very quickly, that one of the things for me that, that speaks to the other <coughs> is that in this, as in the Moonlight, as in Opus 27, number one, he's making a construction where the third movement is the main movement of the piece, and the, in time, the first two movements and the third movement form a kind of, a kind of bipartite thing. And perhaps for that reason, these two movements should go together. That makes a lot of sense to me, especially But I can't remember. prove that. Well, we can prove it because Beethoven Cross, he blotted out the sign that says, this is the end of a movement. And he put the sign that says, this is the end of a section. Yeah. So that helps us. Well, anyway, going back to these three symbols at the end of the first movement. So the three symbols suggest that the sought after joy is only attained in heaven. In fact, in the famous letter to the immortal beloved from 1812, Beethoven described the kind of love that is the eternal union of souls as something that is actually constructed in heaven. There he asked the immortal beloved, is not our love a true heavenly edifice? Given this constellation of symbols in the sonata, the shouted no at the beginning of the second movement rejects the first movement's conclusion in both senses of the word. When Beethoven removed the attacker, he slowed down the speed of that rejection. But the remaining pedal mark at the beginning of the second movement leaves open the question of how long the pianist should wait before shouting. My last example concerns one of the most neglected but important aspects of music performance, which is slurs, how notes are connected. As important as slurs are, however, Beethoven did not normally add them to his autographs when he first began to write out his works. He appears to have written out his manuscripts normally in multiple stages. First, he would transcribe the sketches to the autograph, fleshing out the one-line sketches as he proceeded. Sometimes the sketches were transferred to a single blank staff underneath the staves he was working on as a kind of cue staff. At other times, he would transfer them in pencil and then write over them in ink. Sometimes he would just begin writing them in ink. Once the enormous task of writing out the notes was completed, Beethoven normally went back and added tempo and dynamic markings, again, sometimes first in pencil and sometimes in ink. This was not a one-shot deal, however, as we see many, many alterations in the dynamic and tempo markings of manuscripts. It also appears that he made a third or a fourth pass through the autograph to insert articulation marks, slurs, staccato, strokes, crescendos. These additions were also open to revision as Beethoven continued to work his way through the autograph. Today I'm going to finish by focusing on a place in the theme of the last movement that Beethoven changed, but when he changed it, he made what I call a phrasing mess. And here is the autograph, and these are uh, the theme of the last movement, the beautiful theme of the last movement, and this is the measures 11 and 12. You can see the measure numbers. Beethoven wrote measure numbers over every measure of the autograph. Uh, as he almost always did, he made mistakes in the measure numbers. So there are often one number is on top of another number, um, which frequently happens. And when he would send correction lists to the publishers, he often gave them the wrong measure numbers, which did not help. So the problem occurs in the second half of the theme, in measures 11 and 12. Beethoven initially slurred the highest note of the theme, and in music it's always important what the highest note is, the E that's in measure 11, to the following three notes in measure 12. And you can see the... Right, thank you. Changing his mind, Beethoven decided he wanted to emphasize the unusual cadence in measure 12, and so he shortened the slur. So he crossed out the slur above and wrote a new slur, that just covers the right hand of measure 12. He also blackened out the slur for the left hand that crosses the measure. Originally, there was a slur for five notes in the left hand. Beethoven crosses it out. And by doing so, he also blackened out a slur that, was un that it covers up. Now, these changes, which separate that measure out with the weird cadence, cause two problems. First of all, he forgot to do anything with the E that high E that's left all there by itself. The left hand, meanwhile, has no slur on the first beat of the measure, measure 12, and it then has two slur for the next two beats. The cross out for the left hand, also obliterated slur for the right hand in the measure below it. Simply put, it's a phrasing mess that I think has to be solved by all people who publish editions of this sonata. Now, what did the people do who made different versions of it? All right, here's Archduke Rudolph's copy. 
right? So interestingly, he did cut the E off. The E is all alone, but the left hand still has the original five note slur. And then here's the first edition. So the first edition goes back to the slur where the E is connected. There's a three note slur in the left hand, and then the last two notes have no slur on them. Neither the corrected copy nor the first edition follows Beethoven's wish for measure 12 to be separated from measure 11, thus creating an unusual emphasis on this weird cadence. Malcolm, maybe you could play it by emphasizing the, or by separating out from measure one time so people can hear the cadence. Okay, what do you want me to do? I'll do it. What do you want me to do? <laughs> <laughs> Break before the measure with the cadence. Yeah. Good. sticks out a little bit by itself. Now, there is another logical place to look to have, figure out what to do with the phrasing here, and that's at the very end of the sonata because the theme comes back. So if you look at the end of the sonata, unfortunately, there's bad news. <laughs> there are no slurs in that measure whatsoever, and no slurs in the measure with the cadence. We're out of luck. Now, to tell you the truth, most editors these days, it used to be that if you found a slur in one part of a manuscript, you would apply it, but it didn't appear somewhere else. Nowadays, editors don't tend to do that so much. Now, what do I recommend? And then I'm going to ask Malcolm to talk about this, because he has lots of very interesting thoughts. Um, let's go back to the manuscript. So I think Beethoven's final intention was to separate off and highlight the G-sharp minor cadence in measure 12. So if I were editing the sonata for the new edition, I think I would slur the high E backwards to the G sharp and make a clear break in the, in the sound between the measures. I would also let the pianist know with a footnote, like what, are, what the story is. Though ending a slur with an eighth note might seem strange, Beethoven did exactly that in the previous slur. So I'm going to stop right here and ask Malcolm to play that and to talk about this place and the problem with the slurs and his ideas. Okay, what do you want me to do? Talk, <laughs> I'm a little... talk and play. To play D. Maybe play it both ways. Well, or three ways. I think there's something that has to be said, if I may, just before we do this, and that is what is the meaning of a slur? Uh, slur, the word, the German word for slur is Bogen, bow. And it is, of course, how you operate with a bow. But certainly in this, in the music of Mozart and Haydn, these are very, very central to the, to the entire language. You know? And it would never be possible in Mozart to, to play this. That, that's simply not possible. You'd have dee da da dee da da It's a little bit more complicated here because of the fact that not only are the pianos getting bigger and juicier, if you want, but also we know that pet, Beethoven pedaled a lot. And people talk about this, and people complain about to say, who, oh, you know, Mozart didn't pedal so much, does he think he's better than Mozart kind of thing? So in some sense, um, if this is Mozart, I would, well, not Mozart's music, yum, But that's not what this is, I mean, it's not a minuet kind of thing. So in Mozart, if we go back, we don't have the double bar here, do we? The first bar. Yum. No. There's no slur here either, but I don't play yum, which I would. But I think, but rather, I pedal it at the same time if the slur starts, I wait a little bit. So it's not this. But rather, I think it shows us more about the language is what I would do. That's what I would do. And this, this sign that you see there, is, we now believe very much, and I certainly believe, has almost more to do with, te with time than it does with loudness. So it's, uh, I wouldn't play D, but rather, now is that right? 
right? Well, how does a composer show us how to do these kinds of things? And Beethoven must have done a lot of those kinds of things. And, and how does our notation show these things? And I think he's doing as well as he can. And that's, I believe, sort of why he gets into these troubles, because he changes his mind. He does change his mind. And yeah, I'm going to sure. end by showing you uh, an interesting place. So just a few measures later, in measures 15 and 16, the last measures of the theme, Beethoven originally wrote a retardando over the last measure of the theme. And then he crossed that out very, very vigorously, although you can see it underneath. Um, so if you go to the copyist manuscript, you can see. Now, when he crossed out the retardado, he crossed out the slur, too. So the copyist who is ever faithful, <laughs> it's like the dog waiting for you by the door. He doesn't have the slur, either. Um, so see how he crossed out the slur. And then here's the first edition, which puts the slur back in. Um, but the retardando isn't there. All right? Now, when you cross out a retardando, there is not normally a sign in music scores today that says, don't do this in this measure. Right? So pianists don't know that Beethoven originally wrote a retardando and then crossed it off. So since they don't knew that, know that, guess what? They tend to do it. Okay? It's actually very common if you listen to recordings. I listened to about eight the other day. Right? <laughs> the longest one was Arthur Schnabel. He takes a gigantic retard at that place. Uh, Walter Giesiging takes a mild retard. The phenomenal Annie Fisher takes a retard, but only on the last beat. Very interesting. Jonathan Viss, a modern uh, pianist, plays a modern retard too. So it's interesting. Beethoven didn't completely eliminate the retard on this measure, but what he did was he moved it to the very last measure of the piece. The very last measure of the piece has a pencil, extremely light pencil, retardando written above it. So the last time you hear this measure, there is supposed to be a retard. And then Malcolm, why don't you talk about the pedal marking of that? But that's also in pencil, you told yes, me. Yes, also very faint pencil. It is in most it. editions that you have. Pedal at the very last, on the very last note, so that the piece doesn't end. It doesn't ever end. <laughs> it doesn't ever end. Um, so my conclusion before we get to hear the piece, now that we've focused on these three, or three and a half, if you'll let me count the last one as a half, aspects of the autograph, I trust that you can see that autographs are valuable both as souvenirs of a great composer's handwriting, but even more importantly for what they can tell us about the meaning of a composition and how to interpret it. Interpretation is particularly important for this sonata, one of the most sublime of the composer's late works. The details of the manuscript inform us about such small details as the ways in which one note is connected to another note, how to connect one movement to the following movement, and how Beethoven was trying to make instrumental music have the power of words in the gazam, without using words. The lyric impulse of Beethoven's late period finds its voice in this sonata. Thank you very much. So what we're going to do is move the piano to the middle of the stage, and then after the performance, if, you have, if we're hoping we'll have time for a couple of questions. Um, so that's the strategy from here on out. So you will let us put the lid down and move the piano to the middle.
Thank you.
last night. It actually got carried down the stairs. And, uh, but Jen only had an hour to practice and get used to this piano. So I'd like to thank you very much. And I'm really happy that you threw in some variations when they did the revisions <laughs> of the sections, which is quite controversial in some people, although it's quite good that everybody did it. But anyway, D. probably have time for a couple of questions, but I'm going to make a plug if I can. If you liked today, please join us on March 29th when we'll be examining the autograph of another one of the composers we hold in the music division, Louis Armstrong. So we love to demonstrate our own treasures and the breadth of scholarship in American musicology. So if you have some questions, we have a mic, but I'm, I'm thinking we should have about two. I, I don't think I need my. Um, I don't think you do. Uh, <laughs> for Malcolm, your little time machine, can you tune in or tune in now? Malcolm, why don't you come up now? While he's coming up, I'll tell you Malcolm did tune it, and we discussed which tuning to use. What's the question? Did you tune? I told him yes. And I did. And we, yes. You want to talk about the tuning? Not so much. <laughs> <laughs> uh, who am I addressing? I, this is Kyle Greenley. I'm a tuner technician. I started by building harpsichords and playing. Oh, I see. It's a tuner. Now I mean, most people don't know a lot about tuning, and I, I don't want to get too technical, but basically, um, the simple thing about tuning is that uh, when something is in tune, it does not do what we call beating. That is to say, it sounds absolutely pure. A single string, there are three strings, it has to be absolutely pure. There's one here that is not. This is all right, and this is not. Now, no, I don't have to stand here because I have a mic. Now, the thing is that you have to tune octaves and you have to tune fourths and fifths and thirds and all of this. And uh, I don't want to get, get too complicated, but you have to have a tuning system that allows for the fact that there, if you tune everything pure, you'll eventually get to a place where you have something that sounds awful, so you have to adjust. Modern pianos are tuned in something that is called equal temperament. And that is that everything is very, very, very slightly out of tune. And we're all used to that. But when you get into this period, you have, you, they were still tuning in ways that were unequal. And that is why the difference between E flat major and E major really counted. You know, as, you across, as you go across the 19th century, these things count less and composers get more and more chromatic. That is to say, they want to go through a lot of unrelated keys. And so this, the tuning gets smoother and smoother. This is a sort of, this is a sort of mid 19th, it's a rather latish kind of tuning that is almost equal, but not really equal. So you can, you can still hear, if you can, C major. In some of the earlier tunings, this is more pronounced than this one, but it's not quite equal. And there's a very fine tuning called the Prince tuning, P-R-I-N-Z, from 1808, that's in, I think it's Owen Jorgensen's book, that we use at the Beethoven Center, one of our quartet pounds. It's really lovely and shows the different keys. I have to say that this always gets me um, equal temperament is kind of the McDonald's of uh, <laughs> tunings. Uh, you can go anywhere in the country and the hamburger will taste the same and you know it. Um, but when they actually started using equal temperament more, the people said, you can't do that. You're destroying this. Each key sounds different. And uh, it's really true when you hear this uh, Prince tuning. It's a good example. But when you get to Debussy and he has consecutive chords of dominant sevens, they have to be smooth. He wouldn't write without equal temperament. It's, that's very important. If you have these things that are supposed to slide and every one sounds joltingly different, you, that wouldn't be good. No, well, and one reason we like that, it is very, like everything, it's very time specific. So the tuning, the Prince tuning is from 1808, yes. you know, and it fits the music really well. Maybe one more question. I, it's very hard to see you all. Um, Not if we stand over here. here. One there. And yeah, you're welcome to ask any of the three of us anything. Could you bring up your very first slide, or is that going to take too long? I have a question about, it's an editorial question, but it might affect the nuance. The projector yeah. is off. Oh, oh, sorry, I'm seeing it and you're not. Um, horrible. 
Well, it's the beginning anyway, what was the, the question? It's the beginning of the third movement, and if, if I remember it correctly, mezza voce was between the staves. Is yes. that correct? Yes. We've had a lot of discussion about placement in the Sibelius edition because the placement may affect what is referred to. And in that passage, I, because in the edition here, uh, in the Schirmer edition, that mezza voce has been moved over the top staff. Right. And Schirmer edition? At, is that well, the old Hulu <laughs> edition? <laughs> Uh, but I wonder if, in playing from the autograph, it would, would not refer to the, to the left hand, the bass, that single upward moving voice, vis-a-vis -vis the melody in the right hand. Could I take this one? Please uh, take please. Or, No, because Mozart, you don't see this in modern editions, Mozart writes piano in the right hand, piano in the left hand. And little by little, by around the turn of the century, I believe even late Mozart starts writing in the middle. So when it's in the middle, it's a dynamic marking. Where else would you put it, simply? You wouldn't put it above or below, you put it in the middle. And that's yeah. just a tradition. I don't think it means much of anything. It's just, oh, it's just mezzo voce. Now the problem is, what's mezzo voce? Wait, wait, wait. <laughs> that's the big problem. I think, I think Beethoven uses it normally to mean like, it indicates there is something that he's talking about that is intimate, more intimate than normal. Um, so it's kind of like, I want to tell you something. Okay. And in this case, I think he's talking about something that has to do with love, so we often don't shout too much about that. Mm -hmm. um, but um, but it, it being in the middle, and you're right, it's a very interesting question. Does that signify that it's for all the voices? If it's on top of it, one thing. I mean, one thing when you look at the scores, and this is why it's so great to see them, is there are very practical things, like sometimes you run out of room on top. So you have to squeeze it in somewhere. So where do you put it? There's, and in this case, there was a lot of room in the middle. Sorry, we can't have it back up. But you'll be able to see it. And uh, it's not open to that page, but maybe you could open it. You can see the real thing. There was one more I hate to do that Steve will probably never invite me back to. Yeah. Part. In the first movement, the climax, the, the extreme range between the voices is always a problem for I think especially on the modern campus. But do you think that has philosophical or poetic uh, meaning as well? I do, yes. I mean, I give you such a simple answer. But I mean, one of the things that's interesting about the Ninth Symphony, next time you hear the Ninth Symphony live, notice how he uses chords. Also the Misa Lindus. Both of these have this very interesting use of really high chords that are almost like this chord represents God or this chord represents this. or so. And one of the things I love about hearing Beethoven's piano sonata is on pianos like this. This is a, a, a reproduction of a Graf piano. Beethoven didn't own a Graf piano, but there was one in his apartment that had been lent to him. And uh, so it was very much like this. This is a rod. Did he say Regier or Regier? He says Regier. Regier. And it was made in 2000. Yeah, it's an 1824 copy. Yeah, it's an 1824 piano. But when you hear them, and actually also when you see them, it's kind of fun to see Shen's hands at the top of the keyboard. I mean, he's almost at the end of the space, of the musical space that exists. So um, one of the things that a lot of the people talk about in the classical period is that the fourth piano was not supposed to have an even register from the top to the bottom. The bottom was supposed to have one sound, the middle register another sound, and the top another sound. So that there's a, a manual by the striker people, and they said the top should be like a flute, the middle should be like a clarinet, and the bottom should be like a bassoon. So this idea on the modern, on many modern pianos that you have evenly reg regulated register. I mean, one of the reasons Beethoven music is so orchestral is he could take advantage of that aspect of it. So the Moonlight example is a great example because at the very end where the funeral march rhythm, the bum ba bum, bum goes to the bass, it's down in that bass, it sounds really weird. And then there's a clarinet or a flute that's just wandering around up above, you know, above the bum ba bum, 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 bum in the bass. It's spectacular to hear on a forte piano. And I think that has to be it. I, I feel that Shepherd's crook. <laughs> so thank you very much. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.